so good morning. I am Mary Roberts. I am excited to share my story with you and uh, share with you just one of the strategies that I use with people I work with. And, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about food addiction. Um, so go the right way. OK. We all have a voice of sabotage, which you'll recognize when we get there. But so we're going to talk about that, too. This is on the left. That's me at 260 pounds. And the right is the more current situation. Um, and sorry about that. So I want to tell you about uh, currently, I am 51 years old, metabolically healthy, and over nine years food sober. And it took a lot of work and suffering for several decades to get to the point that I am now. How many of you remember, so if you're over 45 and you're a woman, how many of you remember tops? Yeah. Show me your hands. Take off pounds sensibly. This was my first introduction to the idea that, you know, weight and uh, weight loss and diets like even existed. My mom would go to Tops and she would bring me with her when I was like eight, nine years old. So um, I wasn't even aware of any of that until I went to one of those meetings with her. And it seemed like from that point on, um, I kind of, be, you know, became ob obsessed and interested in that. Uh, so I spent the first four decades of my life pretty much battling eating disorders. My eating disorders were bulimia, which I was hospitalized for in high school. Um, I binge eating, compulsively eating. And so most of us have heard of anorexia and bulimia. And when we hear the words eating disorders, we, those are probably the first two things that, that come to mind, right? We know anorexia is you know, being very underweight. Bulimia is typically binging and purging. Um, binge eating is eating a lot of, you know, taking in a lot of food at once. Um, and compulsively eating, which I think is the one that's least talked about, but probably the one most of us suffer from. And that's when we start eating and, and we don't stop. We're kind of like grazing. We eat when we're not hungry. We eat when we're bored. We um, eat when we're upset. And it just is, you know, and it, we just feel compelled to eat. Um, so I tried everything over the years. Um, how many of you, raise your hand if you ever did Dexatrim or Fentramine, uh, Slim Fast, Weight Watchers, Counting Calories, Jenny Craig, right? Like there's all these, Richard Simmons deal a meal. Who did that? <laughs> You just move the card over, right? It made, made it easy. And then my personal favorite, which is a time in my life where I ate more bagels than any other time, was Susan Powder, Stop the Insanity. Anyone remember that? Like, she gave permission to eat bagels, and that's all I needed to hear. It was all bagels every day, all day. Um, so... I, over the last nine years of finding a ketogenic, low carb, real food, proper human diet. I reversed my diabetes, brought my blood pressure back to normal. Um, I have no more asthma or seasonal allergies. Oops, let me do that. Um, no more sleep apnea, uh, no more psoriasis. I lost, originally lost 100 pounds. I've gained muscle and none of this, I never achieved any of this on any of those other diet where we all raise our hand, none of these things ever happened following all those things. None of them were sustainable. Um, and I was like, you know, so from a preteen till age 42, on and off all of those things, round and, and round and round. Um, and so my, I found keto in 2014, a friend of mine introduced it to me. And uh, at first I laughed because the description was, you can eat, all the bacon and eggs and steak and butter that you want. And how many can relate to that? All I could think was, do you know how many Weight Watchers points that is? <laughs> like, are you kidding? How am I gonna lose weight eating all of that? But I trusted, he was a smart man, I trusted him and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna try it. So that first year, even though I was skeptical, I lost 83 pounds the first year. All of my health issues started improving, which had never happened uh, before. Even when I dabbled in like low carb 
Atkins. My, the problem with Atkins as a food addict is it's got these phases and you graduate each phase and guess what the reward is? More carbs. And so that never worked out for me. So like I would get to like phase three or four and then that was the beginning of the end. Uh, you know, once you get a taste, turns on the, the monster and then it's all over and, and then, you know, you come back six months later trying again. Um, so I had had, you know, that first year had all these improvements and things that I had never experienced before um, following a diet. And literally the first three months of keto, I ate bacon and eggs two times a day, breakfast and lunch, and, and then dinner I would have like a protein and a, and a vegetable. And that first nine months every night, I ate an Atkins bar because I had this, what is going on? <laughs> I had this uh, mindset that I can't live without dessert. I have to have chocolate in my life. This is, you know, I can't live other way. I have to be able to have these things in order to, to be happy. And so that's like what my first year of keto looked like. And even though I lost 83 pounds and started, you know, improving my health, what I noticed was that I was still obsessed with food. And that was that's pretty debilitating when like you wake up thinking about food, your everything you do throughout the day is focused on food. What am I going to eat? Where am I going to eat it? And, you know, just that general food obsession. I can remember like driving down the highway and seeing a billboard for a new Dairy Queen blizzard and like pulling off the road. You know, that was my cue. It's time. We have to go try this. And my whole life just, you know, revolved uh, around food. So that, you know, even though that first year um, I was obsessed still and I had weight loss success and thought about food all the time. One thing I did notice was that I felt calm. And one day I realized, well, it's been a long time since I've yelled at anybody in my house. And since I've like slammed a cabinet or, or a door. And, and then, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to take advantage of that. I thought, okay, I'm feeling really good. My mind is clear. And I had been, you know, my whole life in and out of, you know, I'd been hospitalized for eating disorders. I'd been in inpatient or, you know, outpatient programs, group therapy, private therapy, all to try to tackle this, you know, the eating disorders and, and the food obsession. But I never had, um, I, sorry, I never had the mental wherewithal to like actually follow through on recovery um, to, to do the, the work because the food that I was eating, you know, my nutrition, like when you're on Weight Watchers and calorie counting, you're doing your best to, you know, still fit things in. Like I can remember when I was calorie counting, seeing, you know, towards the end of the day, oh, I have 300 calories left today. A Snickers is 280, uh, so I'll eat a Snickers, right? But it's so like you just don't have the mental clarity um, and your nutrition isn't right. So I decided I'm going to take advantage of this mental clarity and how good I feel. And I just started, you know, like I still had lots of materials from all the times I'd been in programs and stuff. And I just started trying to, you know, work out why. Why do I use food inappropriately? Why do I eat when I'm not hungry? Why do I feel like I can't live without uh, dessert every night or so like what is it about my life that this somehow food is the most important thing in it like shouldn't there be other things that are more um, important so you know I, I was able to start breaking f breaking free because my you know the mental clarity I had so day by day I I thought about food less and less because I intentionally put my energy elsewhere um, I fought back against my Ed brain, like that voice of sabotage that we have in our head. And I started to overcome the lies I believed because we, you know, that voice of sabotage that we have tells us lies that we believe. And then that's what like keeps us going round and round on the, you know, the roller coaster and the merit. You're just like doing the same thing over and over. So I'm now food sober over nine years. And what that means is I don't eat food that harms me. I only eat food that serves me well. And everybody's definition of food sobriety can be different. I know there are people, um, you know, there's people that can successfully eat Greek yogurt and nut butters um, or nuts. I cannot. So even though all those things are on every keto, low carb approved food list, it, you know, the question for me isn't like, can I have this? It's, is this beneficial to me? 
and those things aren't beneficial to me. So part of my food sobriety includes eating, you know, not eating things that um, other people can successfully eat. And that doesn't mean everybody has to do it the way I do it. It's just that that's the way I have to go about things. And so um, my food sobriety is I don't, don't eat foods that harm me. I only eat foods that nourish me. I don't eat foods that, that don't serve me well. And so now, you know, that I um, have had that food sobriety, my mission is to help others break free. I want to help other, as many people as I can get free from that obsession with food because there's more to life than food. And I teach them how to change their relationship with food and to fight back against their voice of sabotage. So what is food addiction? It's eating behavior that includes the overconsumption of hyperpalatable food in quantities beyond what is required. It's food behavior that results in guilt, shame, and physical harm of the body. How many of you have ever, after eating something, felt bad, like emotionally or, or mentally, and beat yourself up for, for it? So it's a physical or emotional dependence that's usually chronic and compulsive. Our obsession with food keeps us from fully participating in life. There were many times over the years where I didn't participate in things either because uh, my, my weight um, or, you know, I was concerned about my appearance or if there was going to be somewhere there wasn't going to be food, I was not interested in, in being places where there was no food. So I lived life from the sidelines and, you know, that's what, you know, food addiction, you know, robbed me of, of fully participating in life. And it's not that I wasn't, you know, I have three beautiful sons and we had a, a, a good life, but there was always like that dark cloud because I felt bad about the way I looked. I didn't feel good. And, you know, everything revolved around food. When we went on, you know, vacation, it was all about like, where are we going to eat? Not what are we going to gonna do? <clears throat> um, okay, so what does eating disorder behavior look, out, look like? So raise your hand if you've ever eaten in secret. Did you ever hide somewhere so no one would see you eating? What about hiding wrappers? Yeah. Um, we, you know, we look to hide the evidence. How many have ever eaten past full? Have you eaten when you're not hungry? How about taking extreme measures like crazy diets or shots or surgery, right? Uh, how about always vowing to start? It's always going to be tomorrow. Tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow's the day that I'm going to get it together and finally stop being this way. Um, how about, has anyone ever tried to undo eating decisions? And by that I mean you had a bad weekend and then you decide, oh, I'm going to fast for 72 hours now. <laughs> right? Or, oh, I, you know, ate like a jerk today, so I'm going to the gym to run on the treadmill for an hour. That kind of thing. You're trying to undo the eating decision that you made. That's what, that's what it looks like. That's what disordered behavior with food looks like. And eating disorders, they're embarrassing. I mean, they're shameful. We, have, we feel like we have no self-control. We think that nobody else is doing the things that, like the things that we do with food and the way that we think about food, we think nobody else has experienced it. They don't know uh, what it feels like. And, and so we feel very alone. <laughs> we have that dark cloud and it feels impossible to overcome. It feels like we're never going to succeed. I can remember starting out and thinking that a hundred pounds just seemed impossible. Like that was not achievable. How was I ever going to, you know, because my track record was I could never go longer than a couple of months before I would, you know, fall off, fall off the wagon and have to, to start over. And, you know, you don't start over immediately when you fall. You, we usually fall pretty far and hard. And, and then we come back a few months later finding ourselves, you know, starting over again. All right, so how about this voice of sabotage? It's that voice in our head that says things to us that we co-sign on. It's the voice that keeps us from getting free and having our true desires. And it's that voice that sends us back to everything, uh, it sends us back to food as the solution to everything. So how many of you ever said, okay, I'm, I'm starting tomorrow, next Monday, the first? Yeah. Who's made those statements? How about that voice says, oh, just have one bite or one piece or just this one cheat meal, right? <laughs> Has it ever been just one? Not for me. One is too many and 10 is never enough. Um, how about it's your birthday, vacation, anniversary, it's a holiday, we're on a cruise. We're, you know, let's just eat. 
Um, how about if you're stressed? You, you know, the voice says, oh, you're stressed. You've had a hard week. You deserve a treat. How many have ever heard that? <coughs> how about, this was one that, for, for me, that I heard in my head over and over. You'll never lose the weight. You're not meant to be smaller. You're just a big girl. Uh, you know, just, ex you know, eat what you want, accept who you are, eat what you want, and enjoy your life. But what's the problem with eating what you want? Like, it's really hard to enjoy life when you're right. eating bad. And it's that lie of moderation. Like, that voice is like, suddenly, after years of eating a whole cheesecake at once, now you're going to be able to eat just one piece, which was not the case for me. So, so what do we do when we hear that voice? We need to overcome that, that voice. And I think most of the time, all of us feel like that voice is in control. Like, uh, and most of the time it is. Like it speaks, and then we go along with it, and then that's why we stay in this cycle. But if we learn how to fight back against the voice of sabotage, we can overcome it no matter what situation we're in. Um, so I teach my clients many tools and strategies, and I'm just going to share one of those with you today. So how we overcome the voice of sabotage is, first of all, we have to accept. That first step is initial acceptance that, yes, I'm disordered with food, and acknowledging that, and then realizing that, you know, because I'm disordered with food, that means I have to take an approach that people who aren't disordered with food you know, I can't take that, that same approach. My husband, for instance, he's never had a weight problem. He's a food moderator. He will, how many of you have ever been with someone who leaves food on their plate and you're like, Ugh, wh what? Why, how are you leaving food on your plate? Or somebody who says, oh, I can't possibly have another bite of that dessert. It's too rich. What? <laughs> when, there, I never met a dessert I didn't like, even if it wasn't chocolate, it didn't matter. Right? Like, so those are people are moderates. People who don't think about food, who don't care, they forget to eat. Who forgets to eat? Right? So, you know, then, and so we have to accept that we can't take that approach of, of moderation. It hasn't worked. We have a lifelong track record of not being able to be a moderator. That doesn't change. Just like we hear, you know, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, right? Like, you don't go to rehab and be sober for 10 years and then suddenly realize, hey, I can have one drink on Friday night. It doesn't work that way. It's the same thing when we're dealing with, you know, this addiction to, to food and sugar. Um, so the next thing we have to do is we have to identify our danger zones. Danger zones are, let's, I'm just going to say it right now, we are all in a danger zone yeah. on this cruise. Okay, there's food everywhere. It's free, it's included, right? And so how many of you since you've been you know, you got on this ship and you've that voice has been like, oh, it's a cruise. It's just one week. Just eat whatever. And then when you get home, you can start over. Who, who's thought that since you got here? Yeah. That's that. So we're, danger zones are those, those situations that we get in where the voice of sabotage speaks to us and we agree, right? So like things like, you know, vacation family gatherings, going to the movies, um, going to your favorite restaurant, having an argument with your spouse, your pet dying, like all these things that can drive us to emotionally eat, those are danger zones. So we have to identify our danger zones. When we identify them, we know we can recognize when we're in one and we can see them coming and we can prepare to, to deal with them. Next, we have to listen for the lies because when we are in a danger zone, guaranteed we're going to hear from that voice of sabotage, right? Like, so here, we're here on the cruise. The voice of sabotage says, hey, look at all the great food. It's just one week. Just have party hard this week. And then when you get home, you're going to be armed with all this great information from all these speakers, and you can hit the ground running, right? That's essentially what that voice is saying, that your health and your goals and your food sobriety doesn't matter when you're here this week. Somehow it all lifts and disappears while we're here. Um, other, you know, so lies we hear, um, you know, so we have to listen for those lies, like that when we're in the danger zone, and then what we're supposed to do next, rather, well, most of the time we hear the lie, and we agree, and we proceed to do what the voice tells us to do, but what we need to do is fight back. How many of you, when you hear someone spout a lie, either in your head or out loud, say, that's not true, yeah. right? When you hear a lie and you know it's a lie, you say something most of the time, right? So that's what we need to do. We have to fight back. So, for example, I'll, I'll use the one for, you know, the danger zone of vacation. Ed's lie is, 
Nobody diets on vacation. You're on a cruise. Eat what you want. Have fun. You can start fresh when you get home. So my response to that voice would be, and I call the voice of sabotage Ed. It stands for eating disorder. So Ed speaks in my head. I say, hey, Ed, yeah, I'm on vacation, but I want to enjoy it without bloat, headache, aches and pains, weight gain, and guilt. I, you know, my diabetes, my high blood, you know, high blood pressure, all these things don't take a vacation. So I'm going to treat myself to good eating decisions. Because when we, you know, when we treat our, you know, when we say, when we eat things that are harmful to us and we say it's a treat, that's really a lie. Like a treat is something that's supposed to result in a good and positive outcome, right? But what is the outcome when we go against our, our commitments or our, our beliefs? The outcome is usually negative and we, we pay for it in some way. And the word cheat, you know, a, a cheat meal, the word cheat implies that we're going to advance some way, like when you cheat on a test or in a contest or something, right? The, the implication is you're going to win somehow from that cheat. But when we cheat on our food sobriety, there's no, there's no win there. Um, so the process is know your danger zone, listen for the lies, fight back with the truth and say it out loud. And then you just repeat this process over and over until it becomes like your, your new normal and it's second nature to you. Um, if you resonated with anything I said here today, the good news is that you can uh, get free. You don't have to stay stuck in this pattern of being on and off and starting over all the time. You can get free with the right tools and strategies to get your mind right and have a life that is not focused on, on food and being free of that. Thank you.